Okay. Ankh Oatfield, track one, Diary of the Mouth. Take one. What? Uh, aren't you ready? Uh, about that. I was just looking over the song. Uh-huh. I, I'm not sure about a couple of these lyrics. Oh, can't you read my writing? No, I, it's not that. I'm I'm not comfortable with them. Oh, uh, don't, don't worry. We'll do a second take if you're not comfortable with the first one. No, look, it's the song itself I have issues with. The whole song. Okay. It starts out all right, uh, I guess. Uh, though some of the cursing is a bit unnecessary. Well, it is a rap song. Yeah, well, I'll give you that. But when we get to the second verse and there's all this stuff about Bookman and Ned the Wino and JJ and Thelma, which I, I frankly don't get. Oh, well, those are all characters from Good Times. What does that have to do with our show? Ah, okay, I understand now. Well, at the end of the first verse, I rhyme podcast with mod past and uh, since good times was a spin-off of mod it sort of naturally goes into a verse about the show naturally yeah and dude the third verse it's well it's just just bizarre count chocula booberry what's yummy mummy it's one of the monster cereals uh, rish why is this whole verse about monster cereals oh i just thought it would be fun to rhyme duel with stool hence Frankenberry stool. What the hell is Frankenberry stool? Oh, oh! When General Mills put out Frankenberry uh, in 1971, there was something of a sensation in that the dye in it turned children's feces bright pink. The technical name for it was Frankenberry, Frankenberry stool. stool. Dude, that's pretty obscure. I don't know if any of our listeners are going to get that reference. Well, if they don't know who the fruit brood is, then they... They won't. That's at least as well known as the characters of good times. <laughs> Rish, I think all that stuff has got to go. Couldn't we just cut out verses two and three? Then there would only be seven verses in the song. Yeah, well, too bad. That's okay. We can end the song with the first verse repeated, like that country song. <laughs> Which country song? All of them. Look, dude. What? You have a problem with something else? The chorus? What about it? Well, the word you're rhyming with dune, Steve, it's just... Oh, that. It's like a fart, except that it... No, it comes... no. I know what one is. I'm just not sure it's the best rhyme you could have come up with. It fits thematically with the rest of the song, man. What? Let's just start the show. But the song? There is no song. But Nigel... Nigel will understand. Let's never speak of this again. But... Never again, Rish. All right. Never again. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts. What is this? Hot Kiss Boy Voice. Everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 67. Oh, this is host number 1, Rish Outfield. And host 0.1, Big Anklevich. I'm not really a computer savvy person. The 0.1, what does that mean? I don't know, I was just trying to come up with something that made me first. Oh, because that would come before number 1. All right. What is announcer man in this universe? I don't know. He's probably 2.0. I'm announcer man. So it's December. And uh, that would mean today's episode is Final Exam by Edward McKeown. About the author. Edward McKeown is a writer and editor specializing in science fiction and fantasy with occasional forays into literary and nonfiction. Ed escaped from NYC but his old hometown supplies much of the background to his humorous Lair SF detective series, as his new hometown in Charlotte, North Carolina does for his Templar fantasy series. He enjoys a wide variety of interests from ballroom dance 
to the martial arts and has the good fortune to be married to the talented artist Shelley Kiefer. He has also edited the Shah Da. I'm not sure how you say that, but hopefully that's close. Anthology of Rye Tales of the Apocalypse. For more on Edward, visit his links in the show notes. Today's story was produced by Liz Mirzievsky with sounds from freesound.org and sounddogs.com and music from jamendo.com and voices by Wes DeSantis, Gary Gulledge, Sharon Mirzievsky, Mark Mirzievsky, and Liz Mirzievsky. Wow, I can't believe I just said that three times fast like that. Uh, be sure to check the links in the show notes. Final Exam by Edward McKeown. The bomb flared. Its light sped out at 186,000 miles per second. A thunderous roar crawled behind at the speed of sound. The wind swelled, and the ground heaved and bucked. Woohoo! Todd yelled. It's a big one! I shouted. The atomic cannon is cool! Todd grinned. Too bad Truman didn't use it on the North Koreans. I nodded. Dad's brother had just come back from flying F-80s in Korea. He'd wanted to A-bomb the whole place. We peered out the slits of the old bunker we'd discovered while sneaking around the atomic proving grounds outside Los Alamos. The bunker and crumbling labyrinth beyond became the private clubhouse of our group of friends, kids of the eggheads who worked at the labs. We didn't mix that much with the townies, even though we all attended Los Alamos High. Grit and debris joined the wind, making us duck till the worst passed. Then we popped back up to the slits, watched as the wind shredded the mushroom cloud. We studied the smoke trails through army binoculars for a while. Todd sat back and yawned. Like me, he was caked with dust, except where his dark goggles had protected his face. So, you want to shoot some rabbits and eat out here? Rabbits won't stop running for two days. Besides, I don't feel like dressing them out, and you do a lousy job. Then let's explore up toward the Calderons, Todd said. Maybe we'll find that canyon. We can leave the rifles here. Too darn hot to tote them if we aren't going to hunt. Okay. Get a flashlight out of the locker, I said. We wrapped our rifles in their bags and locked them in the old footlocker we'd salvaged from the bunker complex. Our dads were always lugging stuff home from the base, and we'd become expert scroungers, loading the clubhouse with old ammo boxes, sea rations, walkie-talkies, and other goodies. Sometimes we brought black powder and fireworks out there to blow stuff up, just like our parents. Becky, our group tomboy, had found 40 rounds of 50 caliber ammo and planned to do some real damage with those. I'd liberated some metal fence spikes the army left unattended. I'd thought about bracing some of the collapsing tunnels around our bunker with them, but hadn't gotten around to it. As usual, we covered our tracks and piled sage back up in front of the bunker door. With our fortress secured, we struck out for Calderon's cave, careful to stay off the ridges where scientists and the army might spot us. For all that, we made good time. We hiked down Krieger's Draw, with the sun beating down on our dust-covered bodies and clothes. Our metal canteens bumped on our butts as we struggled over the rough ground. I carried the map and radium compass. Todd was great at blowing things up, but maps confused him. Wow! Todd said, wiping his brow. I thought it was closer. I pointed down the arroyo to our left. Is that it? Looks like it. We headed for the spacious cave. Rumor said it was more of a tunnel leading to a hidden box canyon. We went in about thirty feet and sat down in the tunnel's coolness. The cave yawned back out of sight. Its roof disappeared in the dark over our heads. I took a few sips of warm metallic tasting water from my canteen. I knew I'd need the rest for the long walk home. Greetings, said a voice from behind us. Todd jumped and yelled. Ah! I ducked behind a rock. Then I looked at Todd and he at me. We both had short crew cuts, the only thing that kept our hair from standing on end. Todd's flashlight snapped on, and I added the beam of my own. Nothing. Don't be afraid, 
The voice came again. Who are you? I said, standing and thinking about running. Where are you? You may call me Hoptus, and I am close by. What do you want? Tug yelled from behind a boulder. I am an explorer, said the unseen Hotkiss. He might be a red spy, Todd whispered. I am not a red spy. I'm not even of your world. A spaceman, I said, awed. Off a flying saucer, Todd finished. Yes, I am from space, but I'm not a man. My appearance may frighten you, so I choose to make myself known in this way. We're not scared, I said, though my heart beat a tattoo in my chest. Then come through the cave into the canyon beyond, Hotkiss said. I'll reward you if you help me. Todd stared at me. I just couldn't see backing down in front of him. I was the child of a scientist. Side by side, we inched down the cave. I wished for my 30-30 or even Todd's lousy 22. We rounded the curve into daylight. Cautiously, we peeked out the cave exit into the high-walled canyon. A saucer lay there, just like the ones on comic book covers. A silver disc as wide as a B-29's wings and about three stories tall. Wow, Todd said. We crept out of the cave, our fear displaced by wonder. The ship rested on the ground, its seamless hull glinting brilliantly. Where are you? I called. Behind you, the voice said. We spun on our heels, saw Hotkiss, and screamed. Ah! Ah! We'd have run, except it was between the cave entrance and us. Hotkiss looked like a cross between a crocodile and a nightmare. Six legs held its twenty-foot-long body off the ground, a tail stuck out rigid behind it. Its chest reared up, and two arms hung from its shoulders. The crocodile head held huge yellow eyes. Fabric covered parts of Hotkiss, and a purple, jewel-like device hung under its neck. Don't be frightened, Hotkiss said. Its voice was a dull rumble, rendered by some mechanical device into plain, unaccented English. The alien's eyes locked on mine, cold and reptilian, yet lit with intelligence. Hotkiss crawled over slowly and settled near us. I've come to your world from our outpost on Proxima Centauri, Hotkiss said. We're surveying worlds and species in your system. I want to learn about humans. Tell me your names. We traded introductions and gradually calmed down. Come, it said. We turned and saw that an opening had appeared in the ship's gleaming side. What should we do? Todd whispered. If it wanted to harm us, I said with a confidence I didn't feel, it could tear us to pieces with ease. I think we should go in. Hotkiss looked at me. Excellent reasoning. In any event, I intend you no harm. We followed him into the saucer to confront bewildering batteries of lights, machines, corridors built on Hotkiss's scale. For all the ship's size, we saw no other aliens. Hotkiss strode onto a large metallic plate on the floor. It lifted smoothly to another deck. Todd and I clutched at each other. Hotkiss's bright yellow eyes focused on me. Afraid, John? I let go of Todd. Not of an elevator. I was startled. Ours are usually enclosed. Your kind fear heights. We fly. And we climb mountains too, you know, I said. Yes. We stepped off the plate onto a deck filled with black and silver machines. A large glass dome stood in the middle of the space. Hotkiss gestured for us to stand there. I felt like a monkey trying to comprehend an atom lab. Hotkiss aimed various machines at us. Neither of us felt anything when he did so. Finally, I turned to Hotkiss, who fiddled with yet another machine. Its claw-like hands worked with surprising delicacy. Why did you land here, Hotkiss? It looked down at me, and I had the oddest feeling that I saw approval in those big yellow eyes. I came down in the desert because I feared that if I landed in town, I'd provoke an attack. Your authorities might panic. Yeah, I said. Especially here, 
near the atomic proving sites. They would have sicked the army on you in a heartbeat. After I finish my tests, Hotkiss continued, I'll reveal myself to the authorities through you children. You'll act as emissaries and bring me into contact with your leaders. Meanwhile, I'll prepare to meet other children. You'll scare them like you did us, Todd said. Watch, Hotkiss said. It went into a machine at the back of the room. Lights flashed and machinery hummed, and a boy appeared in front of us. He looked like a peculiar fusion of Todd and me, but his eyes remained yellow. Even his clothes appeared to be a combination of what Todd and I wore. How did you do that? Todd said. Matter transformation, Hotkiss said in a boy's voice. You're so small, I marveled. Yeah, Todd said, scratching his head. Where did the rest of you go? Tell me. Hotkiss turned to face Todd. Todd shrugged helplessly. Hotkiss turned to me. Tell me. I thought furiously, determined not to let him believe Earth people were stupid barbarians. I might be only a high school sophomore, but my dad was a major scientist. Clearly, the machine turned you into energy. Then back into matter, but you're smaller now. How much do you weigh? Hotkiss stared at me, deadpan. 125 pounds. So, I continued slowly, since matter and energy can't be destroyed, the rest of you must still be in the machine, held as energy until it remakes your full-size body. Hotkiss seemed incapable of facial expression, but he nodded. Yes, John, an excellent display of logic and intelligence. Thanks, I stammered. What's that thing you're wearing? Todd pointed at the jewel-like device Hotkiss Boy still wore around his neck. Observant, Hotkiss said. It is a recording device given to all scouts. All that I see or hear is recorded. It can't be erased, altered, or turned off. It broadcasts periodically to our base. Keeps you honest, huh? Todd observed. Tell me where to meet you in the morning, Hotkiss said. We drew maps on Hotkiss's machine, with his help, and showed him where to meet us in the morning outside Los Alamos High. Meanwhile, you must remain silent about me, Hotkiss warned. Do not even tell your parents until I have paved the way for a safe contact. If a military aircraft or troop formation heads in my direction, it could be unfortunate for all concerned. I will defend myself. Hotkiss escorted us back to Calderon's. Remember, he said, tell no one of my presence, or you risk a terrible conflict between our species. They'd just lock us away in a loony bin if we told them we met an alien, Todd said. Todd and I made our way home in a daze. He stayed over with me, and we had dinner at my house. Dad was working late at the lab, and Mom had a card party. Todd and I talked well into the morning hours before falling asleep. We wanted to tell Becky, Ty, and Henry, but there was no way they would believe us without meeting Hotkiss. When Mom woke me in the morning, it all seemed like a dream. I thought about talking to her or Dad, but Hotkiss's warning stopped me. I could see my dad giving me that disappointed look. Son, where's the evidence? What sort of science is this? Todd went home to change. I wolfed breakfast and ran out. Mom didn't seem to notice anything odd. I met Todd at his house, and we hot-footed it to school. I found Becky, Ty, and Henry at our usual spot by a cottonwood tree. Not far away stood Hotkiss in his boy form. He was real. We hadn't imagined him. I spotted Todd coming the other way. He nodded and went to get Hotkiss. I walked toward the others. Ty leaned his beanpole form against a fence. With his pale skin and light sandy hair, he made an odd contrast with Henry, a stocky half-Mexican. Both their dads worked in the labs. Becky Lane stood next to them, almost as lean and angular as Ty, with a snub nose, blue eyes, and blonde hair perpetually tied in a ponytail. Becky's mom died when she was four, and she grew up half-wild on her father's ranch. I could outshoot Becky, but only by standing on the ground. No one could outshoot her from horseback. She was the only girl to get away with wearing slacks to school. She didn't own dresses or skirts. Hey, Johnny. Becky waved. Who's the new kid? He's... 
I paused, dumbfounded. He's from out of town. Before I could blather on, Hotkiss Boy came up, following Todd. Hey guys, Todd said. Meet Hotkiss. Hotkiss? Ty snorted. What the heck kind of name is that? Foreign, Hotkiss replied. His face was so calm and still as to look a bit unreal. The yellow irises made it worse. I came from far away to learn about your school. Foreign? Becky studied Hotkiss. That's funny. You look enough like Johnny to be his cousin, except for your tiger eyes. For that matter, he looks a bit like you too, Todd. Golly, I sure can't place your accent. Uh-oh, Henry said. Trouble, 12 o'clock high. I turned and saw the usual source of the warning. Jockheads. Four football players from the Hilltoppers, wearing green and gold jackets, and led by their goon quarterback, Lou Grober. Well, well, Grober said. If it isn't the Egghead Squad. Buzz off, Becky said over her shoulder. She could. She was a girl. Grober wouldn't hit her. Grober ignored her. Hey, new kid, you don't want to hang around with these losers. Unless you're one yourself. Hotkiss turned to look at them. Large fighting males, he observed. Yeah, that's right, Gerald said. He was Grober's lead flunky. I hoped they'd eventually wind up sharing a prison cell. We're fighters, Yellow Eyes. We kicked your buddies' butts for them. Ooh, what big men. Becky laughed. <laughs> You've been left back so often you'll be able to vote in high school. Shut up, you <laughs> Gerald spat out a word I never thought I would hear anyone say to a girl. Hey, watch your mouth. I said, shocked out of caution by the cuss word. Grober smiled. You want to rumble? For us, for a you. The other football goons spread out to face us. Five. Becky snapped, stepping next to Todd and me. Are you going to fight, John? Hotkiss asked. What's it to you? Grober said. You want some of this action? I'm merely here to observe, Hotkiss replied. <laughs> I think he's yellow. Gerald sneered. Like his eyes. Grober moved toward me. Hotkiss stood in his way, and Grober shoved him. Or tried to. Hotkiss's arms blurred. He slammed Grober, throwing him back ten feet. The other goons gaped at Hotkiss, then at Grober, who sat groaning on the grass. They seemed undecided about rushing Hotkiss. We eggheads fanned out on either side of our new friend. The jocks fell back on Grober helping him up as he glared daggers at us. Later for you, eggheads. And I'm going to remember you, yellow eyes. The goons walked off, their leader cussing and sucking wind. Damn, eggheads. Oh, I'm show them a thing or two. They ruined my observations, Hotkiss said. I wanted to observe your fighting skills. You wouldn't have been impressed, I said ruefully. John... You do need to impress me. The way he said it sent a chill through me. We spent the rest of the day showing Hotkiss around Los Alamos High. Becky clearly realized something was wrong with him. Ty and Henry just thought he was weird. We saw some of the football team shadowing us and decided to vamoose right after class. Where are we going? Henry huffed as we fled the campus grounds into the desert. Hotkiss has something to show you, I said. We finally made it to Calderon's cave. Becky, Ty, and Henry's reactions were everything I hoped for when they saw the ship and figured out what Hotkiss was. Shadows had begun to fill the box canyon, and the saucer seemed even more mysterious in the failing light. Follow me, Hotkiss said. Reassured by Todd and me, the others trooped into the saucer, and Hotkiss began to do his tests. Only about five minutes into it, a red light and a chime demanded Hotkiss's attention. It seems that we've been pursued, Hotkiss said. He flipped a dial and a screen snapped on. On it, we saw Grober and his three buddies entering Calderon's cave. They want to get even, Becky grinned. Boy, do they have a surprise coming. Yes, Hotkiss said. A surprise. He looked at me, and I knew something was wrong. Hotkiss's hand touched another control. Suddenly, I felt woozy. 
and everything went black. I came to in a larger space in Hotkiss's ship than I'd seen before. Around me lay both my friends and Grober's goons, blinking and sitting up. Hotkiss, still a boy, stood on the other side of the room, just outside the entranceway. Gerald got up and took two steps toward Hotkiss before running into something that flared and pitched him on his butt. <coughs> Idiot, I snapped. Did you think you could tackle him? It was quite stupid, John. Hotkiss nodded. You wouldn't have done that. I don't feel that smart, I said standing. I thought you were our friend. Now you do disappoint me, John. I land without permission in your country, hide among you, near your nuclear weapons testing facility. I'm an intelligent carnivore. We don't have friends. My people are evaluating your people as both opponents and as a food source. Now that I have a large enough sample, I can proceed to do the real tests. I must classify your species. It's going to eat us, Gerald croaked. Eventually, Hotkiss agreed. Now, I must return to my true shape and size. I've been in this puny body too long. He turned and walked out of sight. What are we going to do? Todd asked. Like me, I could see he blamed himself for our predicament. What do you mean? Grober said, eyes wide. You've seen this ship, his powers. They can move from star to star. We don't stand a chance against them. So, Becky challenged. You're just going to give up? I'm going to stay alive. Hotkiss hove back into view, and even Becky screamed, dashing for the back of the room. He looked even bigger than before. When I drop the force shield, he said, Do not give me trouble. I need to select one of you for a test subject. Still trying to classify us? I asked. Hotkiss looked at me. No. The detail work remains, but your performance to this point has already classified you. I looked up at the Saurian. He stared back with cold yellow eyes. They were empty of hate. Of course, I thought. I don't hate cows or chickens. I just eat them. So, I said, what are you going to class us as? You are Tian Shui Zhao, he said. The most common variety of food, it translates as the meat that fights poorly. Do you wish to select one of your own to go first? Hotkiss asked. Or shall I? Grover looked up at the crocodilian monster. Wait! He said. Maybe we can make a deal. If you guys are moving in here, you'll need help. Locals to supply you with information? Loyal subjects? So... Hotkiss rumbled. You'd turn on your own kind, work for my people. Yes, Grober said, his face strained and white. Disgust filled me. I'd been afraid of this piece of human garbage. Well, John? Hotkiss asked. What do you say? Will you secure your life by working for my people? I shall guarantee no harm will ever befall you. I'll even spare two of your friends, though I must use the others. I could see Ty, Henry, Todd, and especially Becky looking at me. This is it, I realized. Custer's last stand. The Alamo. Wake Island. I looked up at Hotkiss and felt sick. Go to hell, I croaked out. I hoped it wasn't going to hurt. I didn't want to scream in front of Becky. Another good answer, John. Hotkiss said. He turned toward Grober. Oh God, I thought, seeing the shift in the powerful carnivore's body. Who? Hotkiss growled. Is so weak that he would be served by such as you. Grober saw it coming. His mouth hung open, but no sound came from it. Hotkiss lunged, jaws and claws meeting in Grober's body. Grober managed to shriek once. We all screamed, sobbed, and begged for God to make it stop. He didn't. Grover didn't die quickly enough. No matter how I had hated him, I didn't want to see him die that way. I turned away and jammed my hands into my ears, trying to block out the horrible, wet, crunching sounds behind me. Most of the kids lay on the floor, unconscious or whimpering hysterically. 
not Becky. She glared at Hotkiss with a hate that should have torn him limb from limb. I knelt down and threw up. (coughs) It was over. I heard Hotkiss walking away, doubtless to dispose of what was left of Grober. I felt a small, hard hand on my shoulder. Get up, John! (laughs) It's no use, I whimpered. Becky shook me. John, you've got to get a hold of yourself. He's interested in you. Seems to respect you. We've got to use that. How? Todd said. He's too big, too strong. So are cave bears, dire wolves, and saber-toothed tigers, Becky said. We took them, we have to take him. I looked up into her clear blue eyes. With a shock, I realized Becky was serious. She wasn't beaten. Afraid, yes. Beaten, no. You think we can? Todd said, visibly firming. I felt heart flow back into me and got off the floor. He's too big for us to overcome, she said. Even if we all rushed him, so we have to outthink him. Tell me what you know about Hotkiss. He said he came from Proxima... No, she interrupted. About him. How does he think? He's an intelligent carnivore. What motivates him? I don't know, I said. He seems interested in everything competitive that we do, Todd whispered. Like a teacher from hell, he seems to want John to pass his test. Can we use that? Maybe we can talk him into one last test, Becky said. Us versus him. I glanced around. Henry had fainted. Gerald sat on the floor, eyes vacant, drooling. Even Ty and the other football guys were out of it. No... Not a mass fight. I touched Becky's shoulder. Thanks, I said, looking at her and maybe actually seeing her for the first time. I think I know what to do. Hotkiss returned. Those kids who were conscious pressed back against the wall. Only Todd, Becky, and I didn't fall back. Hotkiss, I called. He came up to the force curtain. It's not an accurate test, I said. Tell me why, Hotkiss said, in his oddly patient, teacher manner. An animal in the jungle knows his predators. Would it be a fair test to you if an invisible monster dropped from overhead and ripped your throat out? You took us unaware. You won't be able to do so in the future. Hotkiss looked up at the ceiling, then back at me. Sound logic, John, he said. What do you propose? I almost froze then. I was talking with the Saurian, as if we were pals. As if I hadn't watched him tear a human being into bite-sized pieces only minutes ago. Todd, Becky, and I against you, I managed. We get a half-hour head start, then you come after us. You'd simply run for your military, Hotkiss said. Across a distance you can't cross before I catch up with you. It will be merely tedious. I looked up into those inhuman eyes. We, I said, my voice ragged with anger, are not meat that fights poorly. You come after us, Hotkiss, you're going to die. I don't think Hotkiss had a sense of humor. Yet, somehow, I again drew the impression that I'd both amused and pleased the alien. Very well, John, Hotkiss said. You shall have your test. I commend both your intelligence and fighting spirit. I'll be sure to kill you quickly. Thanks, I said, mouth dry. You three come forward, he said. Hotkiss waved a taloned hand, and the force barrier led us through. He handed me a red bracelet with a jewel-like device on it. Take it, he ordered when I hesitated to come close. I recognized it as a recording device, like the one Hotkiss had worn in his boy form. It will record everything we see and say. I can't use it to track you. Put it on your wrist. Reluctantly, I slipped the device on over my hand. It resized itself to fit me. Hotkiss glared down at us. Now run. We fled right by him, inhaling the alien's dry, spicy scent. Your half hour, 
podcast called Begins When You Leave the Cave. We sped from the ship and raced through Calderon's. When we came out, I cut right and Becky and Todd followed. Where are we going? Becky yelled. He's a carnivore, right? I called back, amazed at how calm and cool my mind had become. We're prey. He expects us to act that way. Run away or hide. We're going to do just what he wants. I gestured to the bracelet on my arm. Maybe Hotkiss was telling the truth about not spying on us, and maybe not. We were going to start fighting smart. Becky and Todd nodded, understanding in their eyes. We headed toward town for a mile, then cut back through a draw and onto the ridge of rocks, where we would leave no prints, then headed into the desert, back to our clubhouse. I realized that we must have been unconscious for hours in Hotkiss's ship as the sun was climbing toward noon. Our parents must be looking for us by now. I looked up into the blazing arch of the sky. No airplane searched for us. We were on our own. We finally reached the clubhouse and pulled the sage and cover from the door, slipping into the cool dark of the bunker. Todd ran over to where we'd left our guns, and Becky got water out of the cistern we'd rigged in the back. I ignored my thirst and grubbed about until I found what we needed most, paper and pencil. Safe. Todd sighed, clutching his twenty-two rifle. I turned and made a furious slashing gesture across my throat. I pulled up my pad and pencil and gestured at the thirty, thirty, and twenty-two. Toys, I wrote. Becky nodded, her face grim. Plan? She scratched in the dirt. Get fifty caliber ammo. All black powder, I wrote. I pointed to a large metal fire pail that had been left in the bunker. I pointed at Todd. Blasting caps? I wrote. He nodded vigorously. Wires and batteries, too. He mimed a walkie-talkie. If Hotkiss could read lips, he could read my pad. I let it go. I'd forgotten about the walkie-talkies. Pity they weren't long-ranged enough to call for help. Need 200-foot-long rig for detonation, I wrote. I wrenched open the inner door of the bunker. It led to a tunnel partly collapsed and badly shored up by us. Inside, I found what I was looking for. Sheet metal and two dozen metal fence spikes. I grabbed the flashlight and, leaving the others to their preparations, set out down the tunnel. If only we had the time. I scrambled over partially collapsed sections until I reached a blocked area. I turned back and brought up some sheet metal to fashion a scoop. I cursed myself for not leaving a real shovel in the hideout. As I scooped frantically, I checked the time by the glimmer of my radium watch. How much time had my feint toward town bought us? A sound behind made me whirl, spike in hand. Becky, I breathed, before remembering Hotkiss's sensor. Of course, the monster could never fit in the tunnel. She carried the large pail and dragged wire behind her. From the amount of dirt in her hair, she must have had a bad time coming down the passage. We cleared enough of the collapse to make it to the section beyond. The tunnel turned upward, and daylight drifted down through its partly collapsed roof. I picked my spot, then began spreading the sheet metal on the floor, gesturing at Becky to get more. I took the pail of black powder and dug it into the dirt, then surrounded it with more sheet metal, forming a cone, narrow at the base, pointing upward. I noted with approval that Becky had put the bullet tops from the 50 caliber ammo in with the black powder. I kept the wire and blasting caps well clear of everything. Todd and I had almost blown ourselves up by being sloppy with caps. Todd trailed Becky, bringing up the last of the sheet metal and the spikes. He'd found more black powder and the rounds from Henry's old 12-gauge. They went into the fire bucket at the bottom of the cone. Then I carefully put the spikes in the cone as Todd and Becky used dirt and rock to keep the cone upright. Finally, very carefully, Todd wired up the blasting cap and we retreated to the main bunker. Todd grabbed my pad as soon as we got there and scribbled. How do we get him over it? I looked at them and made a running man out of my two fingers and hand and then gestured at myself. Todd gulped, but Becky shook her head vigorously and pointed at herself. Like hell, I said before I could catch myself. She snatched the pad from my hands and wrote, He respects you. He doesn't respect me any more than a hunter respects a doe. I'm just me, and he won't be wary of me. He'll run straight at me. I shook my head. Too dangerous, I mimed, 
Becky looked me in the eye. I'm right and you know it, she whispered. I looked at Todd. He looked at the floor. Becky's eyes didn't leave mine. I never did win any arguments with Becky. I took the pad and wrote in big letters, Must promise. Run for town if mine doesn't work. We hold him with guns. Don't look back. Don't stop. She nodded. I made her place her hand over her heart and nod again. Becky got up to go outside. I grabbed her in a hug. She hugged me back, then punched me in the ribs and went out. Todd handed me the loaded thirty thirty, but left out his hand. I shook it hard, reluctant to let go. We stepped up to the bunker slits, the same one through which we'd watched Atomic Annie only two days ago. Becky wiped up our tracks with sagebrush, then built herself a blind of loose brush near the mine, burying herself in the sand. We didn't have long to wait. What are you up to, John? Hotkiss asked. I froze, until I realized the voice emanated from the device on my arm. Todd stared at me, his eyes wide with terror. I expected you to run for the town. Hotkiss continued. Seeking the protection of your own army. You started that way, then circled back instead, heading into the desert. A wonderful stratagem. I wasted an hour heading back toward town. Meanwhile, the sun has burned off much of your scent. Unfortunately for you, I can sight track, and you left prints in the soft sand between the stones you tried to stay on. I kept my thoughts to myself. Hotkiss said the wrist recorder couldn't track us through the machine. I didn't believe it. Your cleverness pleases me, Hotkiss said. There is little honor in finding more Tien Shricha. The galaxy is full of it. There! I pointed as Hotkiss crested the ridge. A large pistol rode between Hotkiss's front and rear legs, tied down in its holster. Well, I thought, he promised a fair fight. With those teeth and claws, he probably doesn't need a weapon. Ah! Hotkiss said through the bracelet. Small bits of human-made debris bones of small animals, and indications of fires. You have a den here. John, you disappoint me. I smell your scent. Underground, perhaps? Hotkiss moved forward confidently on his four lower limbs, his immense weight pressing on the sand beneath him. I could see his head traverse over his chest as he looked for us. A scream rent the air. Becky burst from cover 40 yards ahead of him. Hotkiss, every instinct triggered by the sight of fleeing prey, charged. On his second stride, the earth below him sagged and exploded. Sand fountained and spikes of flying metal impaled the alien's body. Small metal chunks blew clear through him. Hotkiss crashed to the ground, blood splashing out on the sand. Well done, John. I heard him whisper over the bracelet. Got him! Todd screamed. We raced out of the bunker, rifles ready. Now came the hard part. Hotkiss stirred feebly. I sighted my rifle between his eyes, just as he opened them. Don't move! I shrilled. Then, roughening my voice, freeze or die! Hotkiss's breath came like a bellows. The fence rails skewered through him as if he were a pin cushion, some projecting right through the twenty-foot saurian. Hotkiss focused one huge yellow eye on me. I have a deal, monster, I said. What? He asked. The translated voice couldn't show pain, but the body convulsed in spasms. I hoped Hotkiss was in agony. I could shoot you, I said, then get you hung and dressed and feed a piece of you to every leader on Earth. Do you hear me? We could eat you. For the first time, I saw emotion in Hotkiss's eyes. I was threatening something more than death, utter disgrace. I had been promoted from food to an enemy. I was worth hating now. What's at the top of the food chain? I asked. Reja. Hutkiss said. Self-meat, for when we consume one of our own kind. That won't work, I thought. And below that? Krokaja, the meat that we eat last. That's how you're going to classify my species, I said, triumph singing through my veins. 
Meat that's just too tough if there's other prey. The meat you eat last. You swear to do that, and I'll let you live. Hotkiss stared back at me. What prevents me from lying to you now and classing you as what I want later? I leaned in close. You told us that everything you do and say down here is recorded. You can't even erase it. Your people will know what happened here. Either we are that meat, or you're weak and unfit. What would your fate be when they review your tapes and learn you were beaten by Tian Shri Jia? And, I continued, we are that tough and that smart. We're just kids, and we beat you. We talked you into chasing your food, giving up all your advantages, and then we beat you. I agree to your terms, Hotkiss said. You will be reclassified. Release the kids on your ship. Then call it here if you can. Tell one of the kids to come here so we know you let the others go. Hotkiss did it. I don't know how. The silver saucer showed up only a minute later. It settled a hundred yards away with a whine of whatever it used for an engine. The breeze it kicked up chilled me. I realized my shirt was soaked with sweat. A panel opened in the saucer. Henry and Ty piled out. You got him! You got him! They jumped up and down. Yep, Todd answered, posing with his rifle on his hip. The jugs ran for home as soon as the forest screen came down, Ty said. The voice said you wanted someone to come, so I stayed. Me too, Henry added. Todd covered me as I worked the alien's pistol out of its holster. I aimed Hotkiss's pistol, struggling with the weight of it. Get off our planet, monster. Hotkiss huffed and groaned, <laughs> fighting to stay erect. The monster staggered toward the ship, trailing blood. We all kept Hotkiss in our sights as he crawled into the ship. Seconds later, the saucer whooshed skyward in a way no Air Force jet could match. The weapon in my hands began to whine. I realized what Hotkiss was up to. Throw it over the cliff! Todd yelled. I ran and flung the weapon. We all sprinted for the bunker and piled in. Becky landed on top of us. Then she dropped the cover. The explosion wasn't up to atomic standards, but whatever powered that gun was fearsome. The ground quaked. As the dust settled, we climbed out, hooting, hollering, and thumbing our noses. <laughs> Becky gave all of us kisses. This piece was inspired by the wonderful black and white SF movies of the 1950s. Them, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, The Thing, and others with which I passed many pleasant afternoons as a child. I leavened the piece with a liberal shake of Johnny Quest and a nod to Tom Swift and Eric Frank Russell. At the base of all of these was the belief that intelligence and steadfast courage would overcome the worst monsters and the most superior aliens. Here... They get both at the same time. There was a quality to the writing of these works of the 50s that has always appealed to me, perhaps because they arose from the greatest generation, who looked at their enemies coldly, unflinchingly, and with resolution, determined to outthink and outfight them. Heroes were scientists and soldiers who showed character and a willingness to sacrifice for others. These children, unexpectedly thrown into the front line of a first contact gone bad, show the best qualities of our species under the worst circumstances. Welcome back, children. Oh, wait, that was your line. Go. I hope you enjoyed the story. I know I did. That's cool to hear. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I didn't expect, you know, you to say... Nobody that. expects... <laughs> Our chief weapon is surprise. <laughs> wait, I think we already wasted a whole episode on that. We probably should move on. Okay, <laughs> we will do. So what'd you think of the story? Was this a favorite of yours? I think I can best illustrate my feelings for this story through song. No, no, I'm sorry. We tried that already uh, with another story. And now it's time for Rish's off-topic ramble of the week. No, I, I understand how it can seem that way. But 
One time, somebody sent us a story. I, I say that in quotes. And what it was, was the first couple pages of some kind of narrative, haphazardly strung together with several profanities, several incomplete sentences, misspellings, typos. I think there may have been Cyrillic thrown in there as well. <laughs> some Arabic too? Or? But because it was a submission, I read it. And suddenly, the story stopped. There were a couple of empty spaces and then a paragraph that said, Hope you have enjoyed this preview of my story. When you decide to accept this story for publication, I will send you the rest. And I sent you my review of this story, just shaking my head at the gall and <laughs> arrogance of this writer. And also announcing that this is the record holder for... Worst Story Submission Ever. <laughs> the reason I tell this seemingly off-topic story is final exam is at the opposite end of all the stories that have ever been sent to us uh, as far as me liking them goes so we have the unnamed story i just described and then way way off on the other end of the street there is final exam by ed <laughs> mcquiewen how, how i think it's mcquiewen I, I don't know how you get all those syllables in that name yeah, that was a tough one. I, I remember when we recorded the story, we hadn't yet asked Ed how you pronounce his name. And so we just went through giving every possible pronunciation that we could think of for his name. Yeah. And yeah, we, uh, as you mentioned, Liz edited this story and we probably put six or seven different pronunciations <laughs> just based on how it was spelled, thinking surely one of those will be correct. Liz will tell you which one it is. Yeah. And when he emailed us back, it was none of those. Yeah. Now, do we? It's not like his name is Mirzieski or something like that. So it's much easier than that. That's right. I don't think we could have accepted the story <laughs> if that had been his last name. But, but that reminds me, though. Months ago, when we asked people if they would like to be associate producers and take a story and run with it, go get people to do voices, edit it themselves, do music, sound effects, whatever they felt like to help us out, Liz was immediately willing to help us. And so you sent her a list of stories, and this happened to be on the list. <laughs> That's right. And she read through the various stories that we had already accepted, basically. And we said, you can do any one of these. And she said, oh, I want this one. This one's awesome. I think this will be great. I'll get all my friends together, and we'll do all this story. And What was my reaction? <laughs> as soon as I told Rish, you could see like the pallor on his face changed from healthy to uh, stricken. You know, and his, his jaw kind of dropped open and he sat there and stared off into space. And then he kind of stood up and he crossed his arms across his chest and stomped his feet and said, No! No, no, no! I want to do it! So I kind of had to go back to Liz and say, Wish really, really, really wants to do this story. So if you want to pick another one, you can. Or maybe he can be the narrator for it. And she said, Oh... Well, I guess I'll let Rish do the narration. See, neither of us ended up being happy. I wanted to do the story myself. We took it away from Liz's hands and then gave it right back to her. So neither of us ended up with what we wanted on that. I hope that Liz still had fun doing it. I hope she still enjoyed herself in the process of putting this together. We had a good time with the story. It's a great story. It's a lot of fun. I love the, uh, you know, as he talked about in his author's note, where he compared it to like Johnny Quest and Tom Swift and et cetera. It's so very much that kind of optimistic science fiction that you get, you know, from the 50s back before everything became evil. I don't know. Everything is dystopia. And, um, you know, there's an author out there. I want to say his name is Jason Stoddard, who has basically made it his mission in life to promote and write optimistic science fiction. He says that he still enjoys a good dystopia or two, but I think it's really cool, you know, that there is stuff like that still around, and there are people that have recognized the need. I guess it, it, it is something you see a lot less of, this kind of positive, you know, people that think that science and technology will make the world better. Uh, I love the line where he says, uh, he's not going to do that. He was a child of a scientist. I guess it's probably a little naive, perhaps, the way people thought back then. They never considered the bad side that goes along with technology. And it's not that 
technology itself is bad. It's just what people do with it. It's like any tool. Take a hammer and you can build a house with it or you can fashion somebody's head with it. And it's not the hammer's fault. It's the person using it. It seems like these days people always look at technology and right away see the uh, bad side to it. Anyways, I'm rambling quite a lot. Say no, something. that's something that we do. We have a time set aside for us to ramble. I also really enjoyed the uh, the time period the story was set in. I, uh, I've told you many times that if I could write a superhero movie, I would want to write a Captain America movie set in the 1940s or write a modern Captain America movie, but with him still speaking like and thinking like the people in the 1940s. To me, that just sounds like it would be so fun. And it might also be hard because we do live in such a cynical time now and people make fun of those who talk. Well, I mean, almost nobody is left that talks the way the people talked in those days. But people mock that kind of optimism and that kind of, it is naivete in a way. The thought of somebody who, who it's, it's like in the 1979 Superman, where Superman says, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. And, you know, she's like, oh, well, you'll end up fighting every elected leader in this city. <laughs> and he says, well, surely you don't believe that, Lois. You know, he's so earnest. And his Clark Kent with the golly and the uh -huh. swell and all that stuff. I swallow that up. Now, maybe a modern audience uh, has become just too cynical, too jaded, even compared to 1979. And they see that and they make a couple hand gestures that you can't see me doing right now. Like this one? Exactly that one. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. <laughs> this episode contains hand... Wait. Warning, today's episode no, 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 contains... No, no, just joking, announcer man. It's okay. Go back. Okay. People did have a different attitude. It was the patriotism and the, the arrogant, we're Americans and we're the best. And, yeah, self-confidence and self-belief. Self and I guess probably Vietnam and... and well, even the 50s, even the McCarthy hearings oh, were yeah, enough that... of a, a stain... To take us from... The fight against communism was the starting of it, and it's just continued to get worse since then, I guess, to nowadays where, yeah, the, the fight against terrorism, you know, that has left so many people very conflicted within themselves as to our national identity, I guess. And, you know, that's too bad. As far as science fiction goes, I know that the present always influences our image of the future. Yeah. And when Gene Roddenberry did Star Trek, it's weird that we always go back to Star Trek. That was a big influence we, in wait, my life. you go back to Star Trek. But I just make this hand gesture whenever you do. He did it again, folks. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when he was coming up with that optimistic future, we had not yet gone to the moon. And the, the space race was on and everybody was all gung-ho about astronauts and exploration and, and, and doing something not because it's easy, but because it's hard just to see if you can do it. And when we did it, when we got to the moon and there was nothing there, or, you know, there was no way to make money on it or whatever, or when the Russians threw their hands in the air and gave up, well, then our attitude changed. And it's like, oh, well, this wasn't worth doing just for doing's sake. That was so yesterday. Wait, <laughs> what, what would they... Wait they a would minute, a Hillary Duff song? <laughs> hey, that ain't funny, man. I love Hillary Duff. Have you heard the thing that they did like just recently with the moon though, where yeah, they crashed found, the thing in and they we found, found water on the moon. water there? So that I think they found that there was plenty enough to go and like they could establish a base or whatever there in the future. Oh, I was thinking you would say, well, we can spend a million gallons back. of fuel so that we can get water up there. <laughs> no, it's just the times that we live in, the disgrace leaders, the avarice and greed and corruption that we've seen around us has really influenced the way that we imagine the future will be. Yeah. And a lot of times it's just how much worse could things get you imagine in the future. It's like, okay, what's the worst scenario that's still plausible? And that's easy. It's hard to imagine that we would pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and be better than the generation before, be better than our base nature. I don't know. I tend to write horror, so I love to just wallow in that base nature. Well, it's, it seems like really recently we talked about if an alien came, an actual alien, then suddenly our differences, the fact that your skin is different color than mine or you have a different name for God than I do or whatever, all of a sudden that that would be much less important than it is right now because we've got this guy 
who's got six arms coming out of his <laughs> back, for heaven's sake. Just his very concept of what life is and all that is completely different than anything we have. Suddenly, you and I are brothers, whereas before, we're just like, hey, I don't know you. Yeah, I think that's a theme that's probably come up a fair amount in science fiction as well, is that whole, once you encounter that very different other... I think it was Speaker for the Dead when uh, Orson Scott Card had his whole philosophical classification of others. And there was the others that are the same species, but are, you know, not the same area as you. And then there's the others that are alien completely, you know, and that happened in that whole Ender's Game series. You know, when the buggers arrive, then all of a sudden the Earth united to fight off this uh, enemy and they had their whole hegemony and all, all that stuff. And I'm sure that there's other, you know, I'm like we've said more than once on this podcast, we're not well-read people, so. No, immediately I think of when the Vulcans come <laughs> and suddenly all our bickering is put aside and yeah, the shattered remains of our planet after World War Three. we're just. I think that's a pretty common uh, theme that uh, is out there, whether it be in Star Trek or in Ender's Game or in any other. The other that's an other human becomes a lot less other when you see the other that is not another human. I do have to wonder if there was another sentient species on the Earth. or if What, if, you mean the dolphins aren't them? Well, let's say that whatever prevents us from communicating with the dolphins dropped tomorrow. And suddenly they let they up. They said, so long and thanks for all the fish. No, they didn't. They made a, a just whatever tiny step in evolution that they need to make. Or our technology yeah, maybe made we its leap. figured out how to translate And their suddenly squeaks. we recognize that they feel and reason and fear and wonder the same as we do. Would that bring humanity together closer and suddenly it's us versus them? Or <laughs> would, would, that, would that elevate the entire species that we're able to look and suddenly see how we are through the eyes of some other benevolent creature, would we start to fear the dolphins <laughs> because they suddenly gained this thing that they didn't have before and, and they are masters of a region of the planet that we can never be masters of? <laughs> I would like to think, since we're talking dolphins here, I mean, if it were spiders that suddenly revealed themselves to be uh, sentient, then the feeling might be different. Or a hive of wasps suddenly uh, revealed itself to be as smart as a person, <laughs> which are, you know, some things that uh, people, something that we're afraid of, something that's kind of scary suddenly revealed itself to be sentient that's already on the earth. I think we might be less likely to uh, accept them with open arms, but dolphins, probably because over the last 50 years or more, you know, they've been talking about dolphins being super smart and maybe they possibly are sentient type species. That they we... have sex for pleasure. Oh, I think that we would probably accept dolphins with open arms. Hives of wasps, maybe less so. I don't know. Okay, well, they, they, they just brought back V. Mm -hmm. And spoiler alert, these are reptilian aliens from another planet that have come to eat us. But they come here in the guise of really attractive human beings. <laughs> they cut their hair too short. Well, unfortunately, she does. But it, it's my assumption that they did that so that we will not like her. <laughs> but that's the thing, is how willing would we be to embrace these visitors, these aliens, and give them our resources and share our planet with them if they were green reptilian monstrous things. But hey, they look like hot chicks and <laughs> handsome underwear models. You can stay in the guest room. As far as the dolphin versus wasp kind of thing, yeah, I don't know. How many times do they make sexy aliens on movies and how many times are they horribly repugnant? And yeah, it's yeah. really rare that we're supposed to despise the attractive aliens. Yeah. And very rare that we're supposed to love, I mean, E.T. notwithstanding, <laughs> the really ugly aliens. Well, E.T. was somewhat cute. He was little, at least. That makes him uh, someone you need to protect like a child. That just makes me think of model number six from uh, Battlestar Galactica, who's supposed to be the really attractive hot chick, but scary evil aliens... That's a good point. I had forgotten. We have talked about Battlestar Galactica a lot on the show. Have you watched the new V? 
I haven't seen any of have it yet. Have you any interest in watching it? I would like to see it, yeah. Okay, Just we'll watch. finding time for it is I think there problem. have been four episodes, and that's all we get this year. woo uh-huh. Maybe you should watch them, and I'll watch them. I've only watched the first episode, and we can talk about it. We don't have to talk about it on the air. But You already spoiled it for me, though. You said they're lizard reptilians. You didn't know that? I had no idea. Yeah, of course I knew oh, that. Okay. Everybody knew that from 1985 or whatever. 1985. I, I'm I'm sorry. It's been a while since we read this story. I mean, it's hard to know when we have one of these other people produce for us. But I don't know what the music's going to be like. I don't know what the voices are going to be like or the direction or the pacing or any of that stuff. So it's a huge surprise to me. Whereas when you do it, most of the time you've Just either played some of it. And you don't even care. Not a surprise at all. It's like a dead. It's like the fish slapping dance. <laughs> I don't know about that, but... I certainly don't appreciate it as much as I should, if that's what you're saying. (laughs) But uh, that's something that I meant to do in past episodes is talk about how great it is that these people are willing to do this. Because you and I both know it takes hours and 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 hours. Shoot, wait. One less and hours than I just said. I I got got excited. I did. But it takes a long time to do these episodes. And that somebody is willing to put in all that time for free, for probably very little attention or hugs or oral sex. It's just really admirable of you guys. And it helps us out. Warning. Today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Hey, I really appreciate uh, Ed sending this story. I did love the story. It's Shoot, I probably had things in the notes. Um, you did say it was like your favorite ever. I do remember something like that. Oh, did I not get that point across with I, the extended I think you did. story? I think you did. Something on the other end of the other story. So something we're both interested in is coming up. That would be the princess and the frog. Let's talk about it. It's something we talked about a long time ago, and we weren't able to use it in the summer. And so we just said, well, we'll save it for when it's more timely. Le- less timely? Wait, what is it exactly? Somewhat timely. Ah, Good. Roll okay. tomorrow, 80T. Yeah, 80T, roll that. The other day we were talking about Comic-Con. Uh-huh. And some of the things that I didn't get to experience. <laughs> um, but one thing that I did get to go to was What? The, you got to go to something? Well, I was very, very late. So I missed the part that I was most interested in. But I did get to go to part of the Disney panel. Oh, cool. And John Lasseter, your friend and mine, Gosh. was the moderator. Is that what you want to call it? He was the host. It was late night with John Lasseter where <laughs> he just stood there with a microphone and then he'd introduce his guest and then he'd interview his guest. They'd show the clip and then they'd go on to the next guest. It was really cool. You would have loved it. You would have ate it up. Well, anyhow, uh, they had uh, – so the part that I missed – that I talked about last time was the Toy Story 3 stuff. I really, really wanted to see that. Didn't. But they had Lee Unkridge there who directed Toy Story 3. I got to see him nod because he was farther down on the couch when the new guests would get on. (laughs) The directors of Beauty and the Beast were there to pimp Beauty and the Beast 3D, which comes out on Valentine's Mm. Day. But we got to see about 15 minutes of Beauty and the Beast in 3D with the glasses and stuff. That's cool. That was really neat. Love Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, it's such a great show. I may have to do that on Valentine's Day. And they had Hayao Miyazaki, who is just a superstar in Japan. Right. And actually seems seems to be relatively unknown here. it's, It's hard to judge. People are definitely not going to recognize him walking down the street. A lot of people will recognize his name. I'd say that one in 50 people would know who Miyazaki is. Maybe Maybe less. Probably less. Anyway, he was there. And I guess it had been his first trip to something like this. And and he looked (laughs) and just shook his head at all the nerds. And (laughs) there was just so much dishonor in the room. He's got to have gone to stuff like that out in Japan, though. They have, like, anime conferences and crap like that where the people show up dressed as Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service freaking asking for him to autograph the broom or something. So he can't be completely not used to this. Well, that's difficult to judge. The same as it's difficult to judge how well-known he is here because he was so different 
than these other guys that, that were there just to have a good time. And his, uh, he, the, he, the man was just so reserved and so Japanese. They would ask him a question, then it would be translated to him, and then he would answer the question, and then the answer would be translated to us. Very soft-spoken man, you know, white hair, quiet and and almost reverent. You realize that you know, two hours from now, Kevin Smith is going to be in this room talking about cocks, right? <laughs> Anyhow, he was there to, to talk about ponyo, which uh, I guess in America is called ponyo. <laughs> that's it's, how they translate it's funny because Lassiter would ask a question about Ponyo and then Miyazaki would answer the question and you'd hear him say Ponyo in the Japanese and then the translator would translate and say Ponyo and then John would be like yeah yeah Ponyo is great I don't know I assume that the character's name is Ponyo character's name is Ponyo All right, you know it's just <laughs> one of those things but anyhow, uh, that was really interesting and they gave him an award and he acted like it meant something. <laughs> Perfect attendance award. What the frick award did they give him at the Comic-Con? It was a, a symbol of, of, of raising something in art, raising art to a, a more appreciable level. And it was a golden old-fashioned ink container and a, a quill kind of I, – I, I, I Sounds prestigious. It. What is it? Very much so, yes. It, no, you know, it's interesting. In Japan, and I don't know that he is responsible for this or not, although he is an old fella that's been around for a while, but in Japan... Man comes first and woman comes second. And sometimes not at all. Yeah, that too. No, in Japan, they uh, consider animation to be yeah. just as valid for adults as much as for children it's not just kitty cartoons it's not descended from mickey mouse he miyazaki I, i'm sorry sorry what was that <laughs> hayao miyazaki um has these films that are full of really deep meaning and they're really serious philosophical buddhist underpinnings and all this kind of stuff put in there and, yeah, people consider animation to be something worthwhile, whereas not too long ago we rented Beowulf, me and my wife, and actually I rented it, and then she's like, ah, she just laid there. I guess I'll watch it with you. And so we sat down on the couch, and I started playing it, and it had been on for probably five minutes. And then she goes, oh, is this animated? Oh, why did they do that? All of a sudden, this movie had dropped from being, you know, a, a valid movie to s some stupid kitty thing. And then Beowulf got naked and ran around with a schlong whipping about in the wind. And I guess she changed her mind back. Well, yeah, I, I remember watching Monsters Incorporated for Christmas one year when I had come back home. And my dad was just upset that we were watching this cartoon and they, and he couldn't get over that it, it was a cartoon and yet it didn't look like a cartoon. I guess he had never seen a CG thing. I mean, because that was before there were thousands oh, yeah, of them every week. But yeah, he, he was just freaked out by it. And, you know, I thought, well, what an old fart. And uh, then they showed the Ponyo clip at Comic-Con and I was just freaked out. And my dad's right. ghost appeared before me and he says, you have become like me. The, the animation style was so unbelievably detailed that it was visual overload for me. I, I, it was one of those things where I wanted, huh. to, I wanted to look away. A, a, a lot of it took place in the water mm -hmm. and every single droplet that flew or whatever was hand drawn and there, you could tell there was no CG assist in any way <laughs> hand drawn and then painted <laughs> I guess it's like you're used to drinking just like the crappiest cheap hooch <laughs> and then somebody gives you a bottle of Don Perignon and you're just like oh <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> but it's just like, no, 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 I'll, I'm going to go back to the rot gut. <clears throat> huh. That's interesting. But the, yeah, the, basically the, the thing I wanted to talk to you about and... I refuse. Yeah, you refused. Good night, folks. <laughs>
No, that's something that I had talked to you about in the past and I'd like to talk about just for a minute on the air was that they also had the directors of The Little Mermaid there who had just done The Princess and the Frog, which is coming out this holiday season. Oh, right. Lasseter interviewed them and asked them about the experience and that. And then we saw an extended clip. We saw an entire sequence of the film. And at the very end, it sort of turned into black and white because it was unfinished. But Mm -hmm. that made me appreciate it all the more because you can't really take in how colorful something is until suddenly the color went away. (laughs) Right. I don't know. Maybe that's stupid. Yeah, I've seen the trailer and it just looks beautiful. It's great to see something like that again. I don't know. Have we ever talked on air about Brother Bear and that whole thing? We we talked a little bit about what I call the Silver Age of Disney animation. And we talked a little bit about the downfall of just them putting out way too much product and spreading themselves so thin um, and it becoming much more business oriented. I don't know that we ever talked about the cheap cools. Okay. Well, and, I, gonna... and you know what? Let's never talk about the cheap cools. <laughs> so let's just forget that that happened. You know what I mean? It's like when, when a person that's good does something bad – and you don't want to disrespect them. Do you try and forget the bad thing that they did? Right. So I'm a big fan of Disney animation. I've always loved it, I guess, since I was a little kid. But there was a lot of dry spells here and there in Disney animation. There's good years and then there's lean years. And most of my life, most of my childhood, I should say, were lean years as far as Disney goes. And then they had their renaissance, their silver age when Little Mermaid came along and then they followed that up with Beauty and the Beast and they followed it up with Aladdin and Lion King and etc. But then they kind of fell apart again. And, you know, they started putting out too many movies. They do two animated films a year. Then the quality just had a dramatic dip and people weren't interested in it anymore. And I remember reading an article in the newspaper where they were talking about Disney animation. And they had people bemoaning the fate of 2D animation. And they were saying, oh, yeah, people, they just want 3D animation. They want this computer animation stuff. We don't know what we're going to do with our 2D animation studio, if we're going to keep it going or not. We've got Brother Bear coming out this summer. It's one of those classic Disney-type films. It's got talking animals in it. And, you know, we've always done well with talking animals. So... We're going to see how Brother Bear does. And, you know, depending on how that works, well, then we'll decide what we're going to do with our animation studio. And I went, no, you can't do this. I freaked out. That quote just drove me crazy. It was like, you're pinning the future of 2D animation on what's going to happen with this Brother Bear, which I can tell, you know, I think I may have seen the preview by then. I could tell it sucked already. Like, oh, yeah, it's got Phil Collins songs in it, and that's always been a big plus for us. And Bob and Doug McKenzie. In fact, our whole ad campaign is based around them. You're pinning the entire future of animation on this crap? And they're like, well, not totally, because Home on the Range is still to come. But yeah, they... <laughs> but <laughs> they put a halt on all production of any 2D animated stuff based on the performance of these crappy movies. And Disney shut down their whole operation. And I was so sad. And then... Oh. Along, <laughs> along came John Lasseter. And one of the very first things he did once he was put in charge of Disney was, bam, I'm opening up this 2D animation studio again and we're going to make classic Disney films. He was really excited about it, and he talked to these two filmmakers about Princess and the Frog, and what really struck me, and it goes hand in hand with what you just said, was how much is writing on this film. They just talked about how expensive these movies are, and that's something that you and I have talked about before. CG animation has gotten so <laughs> Cheaper easy. Than porn. So easy to come by, so easy to make, cheaper than porn. They were just talking about the expense and time that goes into these kind of movies. And they they tried not to cheat and do all the CG assists and stuff like that. And, And just put all of their heart 
and all of their eggs, frankly, in this basket of this one movie. And and Lassiter said there are so many Disney animators who've come to him and say, I've got an idea for this. Uh, oh, we can do this. And I've spoken to so-and-so and they'll work on this. And everything the answer has had to be, well, depends on how well Princess and the Frog does. And back in your childhood, one black cauldron could put Disney in the red for years. Right. You know what I mean? That, that these movies took so long to make and cost so much and took up the time of so many people <laughs> that if they bombed, as Black Cauldron did or Great Mouse Detective did or... Oliver and Company? Oliver and Company wasn't a bomb, but... Yes, they put all this work into making it this lovely, finely crafted, hand-drawn, hand-done production. But 90% of the success of the film, I would say, is going to ride on how good their characters are, how good their story is, and how well they put that together. Because that's just what's missing from those three films that you just named. It's not like people went and said, oh, these pictures are just not as good as the pictures in the last movie. It wasn't something like that. It was just that they picked a story that people weren't interested in, they didn't care about, and they didn't make these characters interesting and fun and cool to watch. Well, you know, people always talk about the follow-up to The Little Mermaid being Beauty and the Beast. It wasn't. Right. The big budget follow-up to Little Mermaid was... The Rescuers Down Under. And you know what? Nobody talks about The Rescuers Down Under. Nobody yeah. remembers The, the Rescuers Down Under. And funny thing it, is... It cost as much as Little Mermaid. Yeah. Beautiful pictures. Amazing drawings. But who cared? Nobody did. And why would they do a sequel? I don't know. I think they probably wanted it to be one of those Disney-owned franchises the way that Winnie the Pooh and Jungle Book. What was the other one that they would do movies of all the time? They've done all sorts of Winnie the Pooh crap, and it just gets crappier and crappier by the... Well, now it's CG, isn't it? Well, everything's CG now, unfortunately, which really disturbs me. I don't mind CG animation, obviously, if I'm such a big fan of Pixar, but I really, really don't like something that started out its life as a 2D animation converting into 3D animation. My kids watched this show that was called the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. That, it, that show is for babies. It is for babies. That's what my niece said. It's a show that they did for kids, and because CG is cheaper than porn, they decided to do it CG. And so they've got Mickey Mouse and Donald and Pluto and Goofy and Minnie and Daisy, and all of them are done as CG characters, and they're just creepy. Anyhow, they showed this sequence uh, where the prince and his stuffy British assistant bodyguard foil butler it's the scene that introduces the bad guy and he's this witch doctor voodoo practitioner type guy that hangs out in New Orleans and all the whole film takes place in the, the 20s in New Orleans heavily jazz influenced and that's cool and that's anyhow, why they got Randy Newman doing the score huh why do you have to mention that? I'm trying to get people to go to it. <laughs> and he sings this song to, to let them know that he's the guy they want because he's got friends on the other side. And, you know, he's showing them all the things that he can do. And there's like all these skulls and, you know, arcane, creepy things in the background. And they begin to dance during his song. And it was so much like... Ursula's song in Little right. Mermaid where, you know, the, which is my favorite of all those songs, you oh. know, though I've had the odd complaint on the whole I've been a saint. And yeah, I was just like, wow, this is really cool. And I want this movie to be so good. And, you know, it's it's weird because Hollywood is a business and so your first inclination, if there's something that comes out that you want to support is, I hope that this makes a lot of money. But I think you and I are in agreement where what we want is for it to be really, really good. And hopefully, if it's really, really good, the word will spread and it will make a lot of money. That's 
really what it takes. I mean, you don't have those films that you hear about still 15 or 20 years later, like a Back to the Future or Raiders of the Lost Ark or... Journey of Natty Gan. <laughs> yeah, Journey of Natty Kids know about them still because uh, they were that good. And I was looking once on, I think it's Box Office Mojo's the site, and they had box office records, right? And they had all these different records of the quickest movie to $100 million and the quickest movie to $200 million and etc., then there was the movie that was the slowest movie to get to $200 million. And the record holder on that was Back to the Future. You know, back in those days, it wasn't like you just opened up and you had to make all your money the first weekend. You opened up and then people went and saw it and then they told their friends, Oh, this movie's so good, you gotta go see it. And they would go see it even with their friends the second time. And, you know, it's like Titanic, that movie made more money than any other movie and it was because people kept going back to see it again and again and every week for like six months it was the number one film in the country you know it kept making 20 million dollars every week and in the end it had made 600 million just in the u.s again and not that i think that titanic is that great of a film it's pretty good, but that's what it takes. And then the same thing happened when Little Mermaid came out, because Little Mermaid came out after a string, like we talked about, of bad Disney films people weren't interested in. It surely built and built and built as people went and saw it and said, you know, this one's really good. I was a teenage boy at the time that it came out. Dude, I didn't want to go and see a movie about a mermaid that sings. But my sister dragged me out to it, and I watched it, and I went, wow, this is actually really good. I liked it, and I couldn't help it, you know? And that's what's going to make this uh, Princess and the Frog movie a hit, and what's going to turn Disney Animation Studios back on. And to tell you the truth, I think that they took enough time off that it's going to be an event when it finally comes out going to be on the news and you're going to have all sorts of interviews and they'll be talking about how yeah disney is going back to their roots and they'll show snow white and they'll show cinderella and sleeping beauty and all that kind of stuff and then they'll show this one so the time is right for it the apple is ripe on the tree ready to be picked they just gotta pull it off you know they got a good script, and I think that they can't help but be successful. But I don't know. I mean, you have your friend who was not excited about it. I, it's not even worth addressing. <laughs> it's kind of – before we started talking about it, I thought, okay, do I talk about the controversial aspects of Princess and the Frog? Do I give credence to that idiotic crap? And, you know, the answer is no. Yeah, I had a friend who said, well, they better not sing. And it was just like, wow. It's there's there's not, uh, not the target audience. No, and he, had, and he hates The Little Mermaid. Uh -huh. I guess he's entitled to his opinion. It's he, like the new Indiana Jones coming out, and he says, well, he better not use that whip. I sure hope he doesn't wear that stupid hat. That's right. That's good. <laughs> it's a Disney princess film. Of course they're going to sing. Okay. It's not for him. But if you hear that it's good, go see it. Give it a chance. And leave all of your political and racial and ethnic issues out just this once. Even if it infuriates you that they've got fill in the blank doing the voice of the crocodile. Just go see this one so it makes enough money that we can make more 2D Disney animated films. And maybe there will be one that you like. I guess the movie doesn't come out until December, but seriously, when it comes out, please go and see it because there, there'll be so much more in store for us if we only give these wonderful animators and storytellers a chance to do that. Instead of saying, nah, I'm not going to see that, and instead we get Hoodwinked 2, which I believe is already in production. I, I believe Hoodwinked 2 comes out a month after Princess and the Frog. Uh, Years more of those, a procession of those, or we could have many, many more films like 
Princess and the Frog and Cinderella. And, you know, it's not supposed to be cool to be a guy and like princess films. You, you, but you've got two daughters. I do have two daughters. So and I so you've will, got an excuse. Man. I will have to see the films one way or another. But they're not always going to be princess films. You know, they'll, they'll do their share of other films, films for boys, films for girls. It just matters that they're good. And I, I've been a fan for a long time. And I'm just excited that there's a possibility that these things may return again. And now it's time to beg for donations. Oh, no, not again. I think we're supposed to do it every episode. What? Every episode? Well, we, we don't even do a fart joke every episode. Hmm. Do poop jokes count? That's not the point. Look, I don't want to ask people for donations. I want them to be my friend. I want them to like me. It's never going to happen, dude. You might as well go ahead and beg. Okay. There's a there's a button on there that you can press, and it takes you to the... It takes you to the magical land of PayPal, where glorious nymphs and big-breasted pixies will help you give us whatever size donation you like. And afterward, they'll shower you with fairy dust that will help you in your day and clear up that bunion that's been bothering you lately. How was that? Really, really bad. Then you shouldn't ask me to do it. Don't worry, I'll do it next week. You will? Probably not, no. So, once again, thank you... Ed, for sending this story. Thank you, Liz Mikulowski, for editing the story. Thanks for the people that did the voices. And thank you for listening all the way through. That's today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Big Inklovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. So long. And thanks for all the fish. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. And they kill that effing alien, too. No, I, I think he lives. I think you're right. But they should have killed him. No, Humpadink lives. So they've got Mickey Mouse and Donald and Pluto and Goofy and Minnie and Daisy. and Is Daisy still a monstrous bitch? That's something that goes way back. We have a lot of those really old cartoons from the uh, Disney era when, when Disney ruled the theaters before Warner Brothers ever even came along and tried to unseat them. There are these great old cartoons, and I remember there's one where... Donald is considering getting married to Daisy and then he like has this dream of what his life will be like and it's the worst most awful thing but the part that I really love that's so funny and you do usually don't get this kind of stuff from a Disney cartoon but he's dreaming of their wedding day and uh, they come out of the church and they're like oh, everybody's like bye goodbye and the family's all like bye date and they get into their car and then you see like a whole line of sailors and they're all like crying they're like goodbye Daisy <laughs> <laughs> it's so great <laughs> oh but yeah <laughs> I guess Daisy is she's not that bad in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse you couldn't have a monstrously bitchy <laughs> character like that it, it, bitchy is neat I mean, we're talking C-word territory, my <laughs> friend. And I'll, I'll not use that part on the air, but holy cow. And yeah, at the end, Donald wakes up from his dream or yeah. his hallucination, and he's just like, you get the <laughs> away from me. <laughs> and he runs away. And she's like, yeah. yeah, seriously, that's what he does. He wakes up, and he's like, oh, gosh, I just about did that. Boy, good thing I didn't. But yeah, it's humorous.